So I wanted to do a follow-up to my previous Starlink video about my dish being broken, and really not the dish being broken, but it was having a weird issue where the Starlink satellite dish was only negotiating at 10100 instead of full gigabit. Now it would negotiate at full gigabit for a little while, like a few minutes, but then it would always revert back to 10100. And it would either auto negotiate down to 10100 or the link wouldn't work at all until you manually configured the device that you had plugged it into to be 100 megabit full duplex. So I had contacted Starlink and the latest as of the last video that I put out was that they were going to send me a replacement PoE injector. They had been able to dial in and they noticed that there was some sort of issue with my PoE injector so they created an RMA and sent it out. Now the RMA was placed on May 27th, 2021. I received the replacement PoE injector on June 11th, 2021, which that's 15 days later. Now, just a criticism of Starlink, I mean, if it, for me, it doesn't matter as much, right? Because I have separate internet, I have Starlink mostly as a novelty and, you know, so that I can do videos on it and test out the service and stuff like that. But if someone was relying on Starlink, 15 days to replace a PoE injector is really not great. You, being down without internet for two weeks could be a problem for a lot of people. And luckily in my case, the system wasn't hard down, right? So even if I had to wait 15 days, uh, it was still negotiating at 10100. Just means that like the maximum throughput that I could get out of Starlink was 100 megabits and nothing beyond that. So it's not such a dire situation in my case, but again, Starlink should have some sort of option. Maybe they'll have this once they're out of beta where a customer can pay for expedited shipping. Like if you're gonna RMA a PoE injector or the entire dish, give customers the option to upgrade to two day or overnight type shipping for those sorts of dire emergencies where they can't be without internet for extended periods of time. So I received that replacement PoE injector, I sent back the old one, and unfortunately the problem persisted. With the new PoE injector, it actually would go much longer, sometimes, you know, five, 10 hours before it would revert to 10100 but every single time it still reverted to 10100 so after you know waiting a few days after i got it then finally plugging it in and then testing with it and you know just then waiting more days because it's you know not the highest priority for me to do a starlink rma i finally contacted them back on june 25th and i let them know that hey listen this issue is persisting I'm still getting 10-100 negotiation on anything that I'm plugging the PoE injector into. And again, to their credit, just like the first time around, they immediately just, no questions asked, they said, okay, we're sending you a new dish. So there we have it, a brand new dish has arrived. And now today, I'm gonna go ahead and swap this out and see if now we are finally rid of this pesky issue. Now this new dish, took seven days to arrive. So from the time that I wrote in and, I, and they approved an RMA of the dish, this took one week to get to me. Uh, and that got to me on July 2nd. Today is now July 6th. And we're gonna go ahead and swap this out. But of course, to swap out this dish, I need to take down my other dish, which means I have to plug it back in, which I've already done. And then we need to stow that dish so that I can rebox it in the original box that it came with, which thankfully I kept. So I can pack it all back up in that same box and then ship it back to Starlink and then we'll get this one in its place. Now a couple differences that I noticed right off the bat between the old version of the Starlink satellite dish and the new version of the Starlink satellite dish. First and foremost, the front cover is different. This is more of like a fabric-y type material, whereas the new one has a nice smooth front. It's not that same type of fabric. So they definitely changed something uh, on the front of the dish itself. 
Also notice the differences in the cable. So the new cable is sort of a gray color, whereas the old cable is this black color right here. Same thing with the stand itself. The old stand is black hardware, the new stand is gray hardware. Additionally, it actually feels like the new stand is lighter. It might be a different type of material. I'm gonna have to verify that once I get both of these off the stands, but I think the new stand is some sort of different, lighter type material than the original stand that I received. All right, here we can see the two different bases and after actually holding them both right next to each other, they are the same exact weight. So I don't think the material has changed, but the color has certainly changed. You can see this is the old one is black and the new one is gray. One thing that hasn't changed between the old and the new is that the cable that goes into the Starlink satellite dish is not disconnectable, meaning that these dishes are definitely not user serviceable in any way. If you break this cable or if a, you know, a critter chews through it or if, if it gets compromised in any way, you're looking at a brand new dish. Okay, new Starlink satellite dish is in place. We have it up and running. I'm currently just running it off of the included router, but over the next day or so, I will do some testing and see if, uh, see if that 100 megabit auto negotiation problem has gone away, which hopefully it has. All right, it is now the next day and so far so good on the new Starlink satellite dish. Let's take a look at what I'm seeing here. So I have Starlink's actual router disconnected and when I did have it connected, I was getting about 246 megabits or so through the wireless connection. So as you can see here, I've taken a Cat 5e cable, I've plugged it into the power brick and we have that plugged into port five, which is my Starlink VLAN. The light on the port is currently green, which means that it's negotiated at one gigabit. And that connection runs through a VLAN all the way up into my office, which is plugged into an Edge Router X. And uh, I'm getting about 200 plus megabits connected through that connection as well. So much better speeds than I was getting previously where I couldn't get past that 100 megabit cap due to the auto negotiation issue. That seems to be resolved, but I am gonna still keep an eye on this to make sure that it doesn't start flipping back to 100 megabits. But again, so far, so good. By the way, if you're interested in how I ran the Starlink connection from down here in my garage all the way up through all of my equipment into my office through its own uh, dedicated VLAN, check out my Starlink VLAN video, which I will uh, put a link to on the screen here somewhere. Now, as some final thoughts on this Starlink dish, uh, I recently watched a video that was arguing about the sustainability of the Starlink service, given the billions and billions of dollars that they're pushing into the service. Uh, whereas, you know, consumers such as myself, I mean, I have not put a lot of money into Starlink. So far, I've given them a total of about a thousand bucks, $500 for the initial dish purchase, plus, uh, $100 a month and I've had the service since February, so about five months worth of service. These dishes from Starlink have been estimated to cost Starlink about $2,000 or more to create and ship out to customers, but they're only charging 500 bucks for them. You know, the notion being that they will charge $500 for the dish and then they will, you know, it will pay for itself eventually, uh, you know, with the monthly recurring fees and whatnot. But that does not take into account all of the, you know, SpaceX spaceships that are flying up into the air and deploying these satellites where they're trying to do 42,000 satellites over the next however many years at an estimated cost of 250 to $500,000 per satellite, right? The amount of people they need to get onto this service to pay for it is a lot, right? And now if you think about my individual situation, I've given them about a thousand bucks. They've given me now two dishes. And so if we figure, you know, they're paying $2,000 per dish, I paid $500 one time. 
Just speaking in round numbers, that's about a $3,500 loss to Starlink. Now I've given them another five months worth of you know, payments for the service, so figure $3,000 loss to Starlink uh, just for my own individual situation. Which also means that it's gonna take more than two years for them to get the rest of that money back as long as there's no other issues and as long as I keep paying them and keep being a Starlink customer. So it's really quite a gamble that they're taking in terms of the money that they can make on this. They really need to start ramping it up and hopefully by ramping it up so much, we're not all gonna start seeing our, see our speeds and latency uh, you know, start going down because of the amount of people that are on the service. So let me know your thoughts down below. And of course, I do understand that that is an incredible oversimplification of the economics of Starlink, uh, but it just, I'm concerned, right? At this point, I'm concerned about the sustainability of the product and I would love to see it succeed. I would love to see it to be a profitable business to provide satellite internet, good satellite internet service to anywhere in the globe. But again, at this point, I'm actually pretty skeptical about them being able to pull it off. All right, there you have it. Make sure you like and subscribe to Crosstalk Solutions for more Starlink updates, as well as all the other cool stuff that we do here on the channel. And we will see you guys in the next video.